The new season can easily be subtitled the Sports and Pichon edition with a vast amount of shows containing male idols, romance or some kind of sport. I still try to keep things as balanced as possible. So without further ado, because we have 5 TV, anime, 2 OVA and 1 movie to get through. My name is Christine, this is Hamstako and here are the ones I'm most excited about for summer 2016. Remember when I believed Kuma Miku would be a heartwarming comedy? Well, I was wrong. Let's try this again with Sweetness and Lightning. Sweetness and Lightning is the story of a single father, his daughter and their love for food. Unfortunately, Kohei is completely useless when it comes to cooking, leading them to living mostly off of pre-made meals. One night, Sumugi and Kohei end up visiting a restaurant which is owned by the parents of one of his students. He finds out that Kotori's parents are divorced and for one reason or another they decide to continue to meet and learn how to prepare yummy food. What I find most interesting about the show is that it's the story of a single father. Being a single parent is tough no matter what, but I feel like being a single mother is still more acknowledged in society for various reasons. With this in mind, I appreciate that the show is tackling this very important and recent issue, but still seems to manage a light-hearted tone, which is always the best way to make a difficult topic more approachable. I would find it a shame if the single father plot has only been chosen to pull off a joke about men being unable to do household stuff, because that would only reinforce gender stereotypes. I also appreciate that the character of the daughter will be voiced by Rina Endo, who will be joined by more kids further down the line. Especially for young children, I find child actors a lot more pleasant to listen to. Judging from a preview event, the three lead actors already have great chemistry. If you want to watch Sweetness and Lightning 2, you can do so on Crunchyroll, starting on the 5th of July. Moving from one kind of family story to a slightly different one. Ninety-one Days is a crime story set in America during the 1920s Prohibition, in which the family of our main character, Avilo, is assassinated by a rival mafia clan. Years later, we follow along as he plots his revenge. I'm excited for 91 Days for the same reasons I've been excited for Showa Geno Goraku Bushinshu and Joker Game. I like period settings. I find them refreshing in the midst of all the high school, idol and sports series. Even more so because 91 Days is an original anime, directed by Hosuki no Reitetsu's Hiro Kaburaki. Responsible for the series composition is Takeshimoto. If you are recognizing the name from what I believe pretty much all of my earlier season lookouts, I would like to point out that I'm not even looking for his works, he just pops up in everything that I might enjoy. Compared to Joker Game and Rakugu Shinju, however, I'm a little bit concerned about the setting. The former ones were set in Japan, revolving around the Japanese value system and its advantages and disadvantages. Writing something outside of what you are familiar with requires extensive amounts of research, especially if it's supposed to be a bit more realistic setting than let's say for example Bakano. Speaking of which, just like Bakano, 91 Days might actually make more sense to watch in English rather than in Japanese, should the dub be any good. I talk about Japanese voice actors a lot and 91 Days cast has quite a few actors in it I like. That doesn't mean I'm against English dubs on principle. They just don't have to make me cringe. 91 Days has been licensed by Crunchyroll as well and will be available on the service starting on the 8th of July. Let's go back to a lighter topic, shall we? I have to admit, I was a wee bit disappointed that Shiodanshi did not turn out to be Ostatakai Oendan, the animation, as the guys in Shiodanshi practice western cheerleading. I assume the original novel by Ryo Asai was somewhat influenced by the success of the first Japanese all-male cheer squad called Shockers, who got quite a bit of attention a few years ago. Since the TV anime has only been announced for 13 episodes, I assume it will focus a lot more on the characters and training rather than competitions. Male cheerleading involves a lot less pom-pom action than female cheerleading and a lot less screaming than the traditional Japanese Oendan. Instead it focuses on acrobatics, so in that regard it definitely makes sense to adapt it as an animated series. 
since the novel is written by a man outside of the traditional anime industry, I somehow have a bit more faith for the project to be more than for Joshi Bait. Believe me though that I'm planning to stay miles and miles away from the fan base. What I find so interesting here is a topic that already has been brought up in the PV. Chidanshi takes place at an all men's university, and cheerleading is not what you would consider a masculine sport. God knows we need more shows which break these grimy gender stereotypes and move away from this toxic masculinity which has turned nerd culture into a festering cesspool too. If I could wish for one thing from Shidanshi, it would be a message along the lines of masculine or feminine being whatever you make it out to be. Just going by the potential of making this community a better place, I really, really need Chiodanshi to be good. Helming the project is Blue Spring Rides and Dance with Devils Ai Yoshimura. For the longest time, I did see a slight catch in that because the team she has previously worked with didn't exactly deliver the steadiest of works, so I'm hoping for talented guest animators. The voice cast is a mix of experienced voice actors and newcomers alike, with Yuki Yonai, Nobuhiko Okamoto and Yuki Ono voicing the main characters, Yonai for the first time in a leading role. I sometimes forget how incredibly talented Yuki Ono is because I remember him mostly for his brawly roles, but he has so much more to offer. Same with Nobuhiko Okamoto, he has been in so many shows I watched over the years but always flew under my radar because he sounds so differently in every one. Sadly, Chiodanshi will be available for legal streaming on Funimation starting on July 5th. Moving on to my obligatory, I'm telling you, this is going to be awful, but I'm bringing it up anyway entry. I'm actually a bit embarrassed that this might be the show I'm looking forward to the most, but hear me out. If you've been with me for a while, you know that I have a thing for certain male seiyu. To a degree that I can figure them out on a first syllable. So while stalking on Tumblr, I came across a bunch of character songs. I usually don't pay too much attention to the franchise because most of them belong to games I won't get to play in a million years. But a good song is a good song, right? Right. So when I did my research for this video, I pretty much flipped my shit when I found out that this is the same franchise I saw on Tumblr and have been on board with Tsukiuta the animation ever since. In Tsukiuta, we are following two male idol units each of the 12 characters representing one of the 12 calendar months. And it is interesting from a western perspective because it is based on a drama CD series. Each CD tells a new chapter, every chapter comes with a different character song and is therefore also told from a different perspective. The entire drama CD industry is fascinating from a western perspective because I can't help but feel that this concept wouldn't fly in the west anymore. Tsukiuta was the first project for which the agency Tsuki Pro brought well-known vocaloid composers and talented seiyu together, and the cast list does read a little bit like my own personal singing seiyu wish list. Since Tsukiuta, the agency has started various fictional idol units because the concept of taking currently popular voice actors and having them sing songs seems to be quite lucrative. Will this even work out as a TV anime? Meh. I have my doubts. The dancing sequences have been shown in the PV. They are CG animated, so there is that. Though even ghastly CG might be better than everything Star Mutish does. I guess I would be happy if they managed to whip up a simple, self-aware and fun story combined with halfway decent songs. Judging from nothing but the cast list, this is the kind of project I have been waiting for. Tsukiyuta has been licensed by Funimation and will start airing on the 6th of July. Another thing you might know about me if you have been with me for a while is that I quite like Natsumi Yujin Show. While the next show isn't Natsumi Yujin Show, it has Yokai 2. Fugigena Mononokian is the story of Hanai. On his first day of high school, he steps on the tail of this fluffy little yokai furball, who understandably is upset about that and possesses Hanai. He hopes to get rid of it with the help of a Mononokian who happens to attend his school. I have to say the PV was a little bit disappointing. Every scene that does not contain yokai or spirits seems a bit generic and rather mundane. Like the entire world is one giant stock model. 
I hope that the show manages to make up for animation that's a bit rough around the edges with enchanting little stories. After all, Japanese folklore is so multifaceted that there should be enough material to come up with something creative. The tiny yokai had me on board from minute one, and if the show takes a more comedic turn than Natsume Yujin show, then I'm more than fine with that. Fukigena Mononokia will be available for legal streaming on Crunchyroll, starting on July 3rd. Moving on to a fantasy setting that couldn't be farther away from a stock model. Seriously, if Guillermo del Toro made an anime, the ancient Magus Bride would be it. It's the story of Chise. She grew up without a family and is taken in by Elias after being sold during an auction. The animal-headed mage takes her with him into a fantasy realm where she's supposed to become his bride. I hadn't heard of the manga before, but after seeing the PV I felt immediately drawn to it. Not only is it my kind of aesthetic and the fantasy setting at that, the way it is directed in combination with the arcane designs of characters and creatures alike, and the fake compositions by Junichi Matsumoto put me under a spell and sucked me right into this universe. It's the kind of magic that only film, or animation in this case, can create, not because it's the inherently better medium per se, but because only very few writers are able to bring a world like this to life. I have the manga lying around, but I will most likely wait to read it until I've seen the three-part OVA series, and until then I don't even want to know too much about the story. The Ancient Magus Bride will have a limited theatrical release in Japan starting on August 13th, and will later be published with the volumes 6, 7 and 8 of the manga. This way the publishing process will take until well into 2017, and I can only hope that Western publishers jump on the opportunity to localize those bundles in a timely fashion. I'm throwing in the next OVA more to give a quick warning. The issues 21 and 22 of the Akatsuki no Yuna manga will be bundled with two OVA episodes adapting Zeno's backstory. If you haven't read the manga up to that point, I urge you not to watch them. You were okay watching the first OVA episode because it adapted a bonus chapter. A filler, if you like. Nice to have, but not really necessary. Everything that happens between the end of season 1 and those two OVA episodes peaks in Zeno's backstory, and I highly doubt that it would have any kind of impact on you if you're missing the content of about 50 chapters, each around 30 pages long. Zeno's backstory is beautiful and pretty much answers all of the questions you might still have, but to you, he is still a stranger because you've spent about 15 minutes with him. The decision to adapt Zeno's arc separately appears nonsensical to me too, and it's pretty much a death sentence to all hope to a second season. So all I can say right now is catch up to the manga until August 19th, or stay as far away from it as you can. And finally, my animated movie highlight of 2016. <laughs> Makoto Shinkai's latest film called Kimi no Nawa, or Your Name, seems to be a coming-of-age story with a supernatural twist. The two protagonists, a boy and a girl, called Taki and Mitsuha, live fairly different lives. Taki in Tokyo and Mitsuha on the countryside, and they have never met each other in real life, only in dreams. Sooner or later they have to find out that those dreams have a much bigger impact than they would have expected. What I like about his movies is his attention to detail, not only in the form of lens flares and shiny shiny metal, but in the way we behave. His strongest film in that regard might have been The Garden of Words and his depiction of depression. In Children Who Chase Lost Voices we were told a story about how life is an endless accumulation of meetings and departures, but the longer his movies are, the more prone to losing himself he gets. All of his movies so far were solid, and while some might resonate more with me than others, I can't help but feel that his writing can never quite keep up with his stunning photorealistic animation. He is definitely on the right path, and all he needs right now is an extra push. Maybe he's gotten it for Kimi no Nawa. Your Name has celebrated its world premiere this weekend at Anime Expo in Los Angeles before its theatrical release in Japan on the 26th of August. So if some of you lucky bastards have already seen it, know that I'm quite jealous of you. 
So much for a regular uploading schedule, huh? I have scripts lying around, I just need to get off my ass and film them. So if you have faith that I can get back on track, then don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you next time. Yeah.